Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Rick, and good morning, and thank you for letting us know that you're watching us online, that you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube One, and be sure and just communicate with us throughout the, the message, and as I read the scriptures, you follow along. If you haven't downloaded our app yet, you can go to the App Store on Google or on uh, the Apple App Store and just look for Woodland Church Mobile and download the app, and you'll find the notes right in there. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity in a few minutes just to share any prayer requests that you might have. You can do that on the app using the communication cards there and just share with us what's on your heart and your mind so that we can pray with you. Well, during this COVID-19 crisis, I have really tried to just seek the Lord and, and pray and bring you a series of messages about how to respond during the coronavirus. As a matter of fact, I received a book in the mail this week from someone that sent me a book about how to respond during the corona crisis. And I just opened it up and I looked at the, um, when it was printed, and it was printed within the first few days of the corona crisis. And I thought to myself, I wonder how they knew how to respond to the corona crisis because we were just entering into it, and it seemed like the government and everyone else was, was just confused about what we should do. We've never been through a time like this. I think the word unprecedented has been a little bit overused because there have been challenging and difficult times before in the history of our nation, in the history of God's people, the church, and in Israel. Uh, we've seen all sorts of crises, whether it's been famines or war or plagues, uh, whether it's been pestilence that has come along, and there are a number of those taking place in the world right now, than just the coronavirus. And so as I was praying last week and I was thinking about this service, one of the things that God really laid upon my heart was, how do we listen to God? How would He hear the voice of God? And by the way, I haven't read that book yet, so I'm not commenting on whether it's any good or not, but I know during this time I have really been searching my Bible. I've been looking for biblical examples of how people have responded, how they've listened to the Lord. I have been looking at historical examples uh, of how people responded uh, during a crisis, whether it's been a pandemic or pestilence or war, on how to listen to God. I have read the sermons of, of preachers from World War II, World War I, the war between the states. I have read devotional material from that time just trying to see how others have responded to that. So today, I want to take you to the Word of the Lord and what God says, and from a little bit of my experience of when some things have gone deeply wrong in life, uh, for me personally, of how you can listen to God speak, how you can hear God. And one of the first things I want to say to you before we pray is to say to you, yes, God still speaks today. As a matter of fact, this morning I tweeted out a message and said from Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, it's not in the outline, but just maybe write these down. And could I ask you, I just, just thought of this, so if you've got anything else on besides the, 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 the message right now, would you just kind of get rid of every other disturbance and be sure you've got your Bible and your notepad, especially if you've got your family there. Parents, you just set such an example when you're sitting there with your Bible and you're, you're reading and following along and your children can follow along with you. But let's just really focus in, just like we were sitting here at the sanctuary, and it won't be long that we can all gather back together. Our small groups can begin to gather again. We can gather in the church to worship. But in the meantime, we need to remove every distraction so that when we're listening to the message and we're reading the Word of God, we're giving God our very best attention, and we're seeking Him because during the preaching of the Word, God will speak to you. I am firmly confident of that, and it's not that I believe that I'm going to talk to you, which I am, but I believe that God will speak to you through the message, but listen to what it said in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, today when you hear his voice. Today, when you hear his voice. Wow, that just, boom, hit me like a ton of bricks. And then I just flipped right over to Hebrews chapter 12 and says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. Now, notice it doesn't say has spoken, but the one who is speaking. God still speaks to his people today. 
Now, what he says to us will never contradict the Bible. What he says to us will never contradict his word. But God is still speaking to you and I, not just by the Bible, but by his Holy Spirit who lives within us, brings back the word of God to our memory, also gives us those nudges and those impressions that we need. And I'm so thankful for that because we're not robots. We are not machines that have been programmed and have no choice but to do what the program tells us to do. Robots don't feel, robots don't think, but you and I, God created us in His image so that we can think. God has created us in His image and He drilled right into the side of our heads two holes and in our front of our face one mouth. And so for me that says I need to do twice as much listening as I do speaking. And when you're, when you're called to do what I do, and I do a lot of speaking, it means I also need to do a lot of listening as well. So I've really tried to train and discipline myself over the years to be a good listener. And when God speaks to me, sometimes He encourages me, sometimes He corrects me, sometimes God rebukes me, sometimes He convicts me of sin. But because I know that I'm created in His image, I welcome not only the encouragement, I welcome the rebuke, I welcome the correction, because I know that God is each and every day, He's trying and working in me to make me more like Jesus Christ. And who doesn't want to be more loving? Who doesn't want to be more kind? Who doesn't want to be more powerful in the things of the Holy Spirit? I, I, I don't fear His correction and His rebuke, because I know that he means it for my good, and he's trying to build me up. And another thing is, I don't worry about losing my personality. A, a robot only has a created personality, whether it's R2-D2 or CP3O. It only has a created personality that operates within the realm of the program, no matter how advanced the artificial intelligence may be. But you and I are created in the image of God, and God is not wanting to dominate us. God is wanting a relationship, a father-son, a father-daughter relationship. Jesus even compares his relationship to the church as the bride and the bridegroom. So for me, and according to the Word of God, prayer is this honest exchange of friendship. It's this honest conversation where we talk to God and God talks to us where we speak to God and where we listen to God. Look with me this morning at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Dear friends, let us practice loving each other, for love comes from God, and those who are loving and kind show that they are the children of God and that they are getting to know Him better. But if a person isn't loving and kind, it shows that he doesn't know God. Read this out loud with me. For God is love. You see, one of the first characteristics of people who really hear from God well are people who love God. It's not just people who say they love God, but if you love God, you love other people. You love not only your family, your wife, you love not only your, your friends, but you love your enemies as well. Because the Scripture tells us that love has to be practiced. Look at that verse again. Let us practice loving one another. I don't know about you, but I still need lots of practice on learning how to love well and how to love correctly. As a matter of fact, I don't believe our world really understands love anymore. As I was getting ready this morning, I flipped on the news real quickly just to kind of see if there were any COVID crisis updates, and there was a song playing, and the song was talking about love, but as I listened to the lyrics on the television, that song wasn't about love at all. It was more about lust. And you see, love is that quality where we look out for the good of the other person. That love is that quality where we adore them and we have affection for them, but we also are willing to sacrifice for them. And because you and I are created in the image of God, we have the ability to love like God. Never as perfectly as God, but to love like God. That has taught me a lot about learning to listen to God. Because I know that He loves me. And I know that when he corrects me, I know that when he rebukes me, or when he encourages me, he's doing it for my good. I know that when he does it, it comes out of a heart of love, and it doesn't come out of a heart of condemnation. It doesn't come out of a, a spirit that doesn't like me. It doesn't come out of a spirit that's against me, but a spirit 
the Spirit of God that is for me. And if Christ be for us, who in the world or who in the, in the realms eternal could ever be against you and I? Now, I have to be honest. When I was a young person and a young adult, I was really confused about this whole listening to God thing. Because in the kind of spiritual atmosphere I grew up in, in my church, it Growing up, it sounded like God was always talking to people. God was telling them things all the time. And sometimes God would tell them things that just seemed wacko and or else it never just came about the way they said that it would. So I got very confused about that. And early on in my Christian life, I really sought to just study the Word of God and I wanted just to be, just keep myself confined within the book. And so, in a sense, it stunted me on being able to hear the voice of God prompt me because I was so stunted by just staying within the pages of the book. And let me see if I can explain that to you. Because when I would ask questions as a young, young, young person right into my early 20s, when people would say they heard from God and either it was unscriptural or else it didn't work out the way they said it would and Sometimes when people failed at what they said that God had told them to do, then I would hear this, and they say, well, that was just the flesh talking to them, and I just didn't understand. Of course, that's the word the King James Version uses, that's just the flesh, and so I would look it up, and, and the Bible says those in, in the old King James Version, it would talk very negatively about the flesh. Well, it wasn't until I was a student in Bible college that I learned that that word flesh actually meant our self-will, not our not our body and our skin. I really didn't understand that. And so when they would say the flesh was talking to them, that, that confused me. But what I grew up and I learned was this. My self-will can sometimes confuse me about what God wants. Have you ever noticed that when you're praying about something and you really want to hear from God and you really want this? It can be real easy to get your will and God's will mixed up. That's why the Bible, it's very important to stay with what the Bible says because the Bible is, God will always speak to you in line with His Word. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that there is a path before everyone that seems right, but the end of that path leads to death. And then sometimes it's the devil that will actually just speak to you. Now, I don't believe the devil can ever make you do anything, but it is very possible that the devil can actually speak to you. In Matthew 16, as a matter of fact, I just thought of this, there's a great story of Peter. He heard from God. He confessed Christ. He says, thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, for God has revealed this to you. What a hallelujah moment. I mean, what a high five moments from Jesus. Blessed are you, Simon. God has revealed this to you. Well, in the same conversation, Peter says something so off the wall and so wacko that Jesus turns around and rebukes Peter and says, get thee behind me, devil. So you see, in the same, conver in the same conversation, if we're not careful, we can also listen to the voice of the devil who will lead us and tempt us to go off path and off of what the word of the Lord says. So that's why I say to you, and I have said to you as your pastor for all these years, Reading your Bible every single day. I can't emphasize how important that is to sit down and read your word. And before I leave today, I will ask each one of these pastors that are here with me this morning, I'll ask everyone, I'll say, what did God say to you? Chapter and verse today, please. And it's okay if you say it was one of the verses from the message today, in case you haven't read your Bible yet. But the point of the matter is, each and every day, take time to sit down and listen to the Lord. So let me give you just a few easy, memorable steps. This is the most simple outline I've ever put together. As a matter of fact, my daughter brought the outline back to me before she printed it up for us and put it on the, on the, the app. She said, Dad, this is too simple. You need to rework this message. That's the first time in her life she's ever came back and rebuked me and told me that I needed to rework my message. But I told her we're going to stick with a very simple outline this morning. Six easy but six profound steps that you can take to develop your ear, your spiritual ear, to listening to God. Number one, withdraw. Withdraw. Now, you know that here at Woodland, one of the things we teach about marriage is that 
Each of us need to take some time every year to get away, to withdraw and get alone. Spend a few days alone with our wife. Or if you're a woman, spend a few days alone with your husband. But getting alone with God, there was a song that we sang in my childhood that I still sing so often, and it just simply said, shut, shut in with God in a secret place, there in His presence, beholding His face, gaining new power to run in the race. Oh, how I love to be shut in with God. And I can't tell you how many times through the years, in the early morning hours, I've lifted my hands and I, I've sang that song to the Lord. Don't be afraid of solitude. Don't be afraid to be alone. In this busy, busy world where there is so much static trying to get our attention all the time, it's why I ask you to shut off every other distraction and just pay attention to the scriptures this morning and follow along with the outline in the message today. Is because there's not much quiet space in our lives. When the shelter in place is over, when this shelter in place order is over and people are back to work and people are doing life normally again, the old temptation to get busy, busy, busy again. I've always made it a habit to never tell anybody that I'm busy. And it's not that my life is not full. It's not that I don't have a, a lot to do. But when I was a young pastor, um, a young youth pastor, I was always moving about real fast, trying to get things done. And my pastor pulled me aside and he said to me, Dennis, you're walking so fast that everybody thinks you're busy. You don't ever want to give the impression that you're busy. You're a man of God and our work is people. You want to love people and be with people. And I never, I never lost touch with his, his correction in my life and how he taught me how important it was to withdraw. As a matter of fact, I can often hear my pastor, Jimmy White, I can hear him in the sanctuary where he would be walking back and forth across the sanctuary and he would be praying and seeking God. And as a youth pastor, I can't tell you how much that good that did for me to know that my pastor was in the sanctuary by himself seeking the Lord and praying and calling out on the name of the Lord. And I think that's one of the reasons why we experienced such an incredible revival I've always credited what happened on our high schools and in our colleges and in our church with the fact that our pastor was a man of God. He knew how to get alone and he knew how to pray. He would take several times during the year and he would withdraw for just three days and he would go away by himself to pray and seek the Lord. And there was a difference about him every time he came back. When I asked him about that one time, he said, well, it's what Jesus did. Jesus spent 40 days alone. Jesus withdrew and spent a whole night in prayer by himself before he, he called his disciples. Jesus went to a garden alone to pray. Jesus took three of his disciples up to a mountaintop. There in the silence of the mountains, Jesus, there he, he, he was transfigured before them. You see, there is power in being alone with God. When John the Baptist was martyred, Jesus got out by himself and so it's been my pattern of life for, for over 40 years now as a pastor. Every year I withdraw for two weeks and I get alone with God and I pray and I seek Him for direction for our congregation and I, I seek Him for wisdom. I did it when I was in district office. I would just go away by myself to seek the Lord and to fast and pray. Friends, one of the first things I can say to you, if you want to learn to listen to God, is get alone. No TV, no internet, no radio. Get alone with God and with your Bible. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 42 and verse 1. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. So ask yourself this question this morning. Maybe grade yourself on a scale of 1 to 7. How thirsty am I for God? How thirsty do I feel this, this need for righteousness? How thirsty am I to be alone with God? And if you're a busy mom today, I understand that. My wife raised four children. I was traveling and speaking over 300 times a year. So that's a lot of 300 times a year. That's a lot of airplane flights and a lot of hotel rooms. But I remember asking Becky how she got alone and Sometimes she said I would just shut myself alone in the bathroom. And she told me one time the story of Susanna Wesley. As a matter of fact, she read it to me. We were on, we were on a trip together. Susanna, I believe, had nine or ten children. 
And those children knew that when Susanna, Mrs. Wesley, sat down in her chair and she pulled her apron over her head to be alone with God, they knew not to bother her. So even if you're a busy mom, find five minutes if you can when the baby's napping or when the children are doing their studies and get along with God. There are people who come to our sanctuary and will just spend time along in our sanctuary and pray. Sometimes I go to the park. Metro parks are such a blessing here in the metro area of Detroit. And there I'll just walk in the woods and be alone with the Lord and pray. The second word I'd say is wait. Withdraw and then wait. Because when you get before God and you get in solitude, you just need to relax. Yes, you're in the presence of the Almighty God. Yes, you're in His holy presence. And I, I never want you to lose that sense of his awesomeness. But you're never going to grasp that awesomeness as long as you're uptight, as long as you're tense. But you'll grasp it as you relax in the presence of the Lord. I know for me in the mornings when I get up alone, I, I get a cup of coffee. I don't eat until after I've had my devotions and read the word of the Lord. And, but I'll sit there with a cup of coffee and I'll say, Lord, it is so good to be back in your presence this morning. Father, thank you for watching over my family and me while we slept last night. Thank you that you, you never slumber, you never sleep. And I just lift my hands up to him and I relax in his presence. And as I quiet my soul and I'm alone with God, I anticipate the presence of God. Here at Woodland, we give away these little devotional books called Bread of Life. Maybe I'll read just a section out of the Bread of Life, just a kind of like that old crank that it used to have to, we used to have to crank up an old tractor with on the farm, but you put it in and it just kind of gets the motor going along with that cup of coffee. And if you're new to faith and you use this Bible that we have that we give away here, there are all kinds of helps right here in the front that give you different reading tracks. For instance, here's a track on cornerstones on how to know some of the great doctrines of the Bible. Here's a track if you're just beginning to read your Bible, you've given your heart to Jesus, how to understand what you've done and given your heart to Christ. Here are some of the big questions if you have questions. This is one of the best little Bibles. It's a New Testament that we give away for those who have just given their hearts to Christ. And I'll be happy to send you one of these if you need one or would like to have one. But it's a great way to learn how to read your Bible. But listen to Psalms 37 in verse 7. Be still in the presence of God and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. I want you, if you would, if you can, <clears throat> if you have your Bible or if you're taking notes, circle these, these verbal phrases. Be still. Just get quiet. And you see, sometimes quiet is unnerving, especially right now. If I just get quiet for three seconds, we're like, what's going on? But you've got to be still in the presence of God. Look at that next phrase, wait patiently. Don't be in a hurry. If when you get up and you start with five minutes, don't worry that it's just five minutes. God understands you're learning, you're growing in this. But wait patiently for God to act, for God to work in your life. Circle this next phrase, don't worry. Whatever you're worried about, write those down. Here's my journal, and I'll talk about this in just a few minutes, but here's my, my paper journal that I use. This is a new one. I just filled up my old one, and I've started another one. But fill, use your journal. Write down whatever's on your mind. I do that frequently. Whatever's bothering me, for instance, there's been so much coming across my desk and my email with this COVID crisis and all the ministries of our church that have to go on, plus family and people that, you know, there's just been a lot of things I've been tempted to really worry and fret about. So I, I write those down, and I'll talk about that more in just a moment. And then look at this one, or fret. You know, fret means just to walk around thinking about it all day. We're going to talk about how to do that. But that's how you relax in the presence of God, for Jesus is waiting for you. Jesus is waiting on you to come to him. Now, if you're not a morning person, then maybe you're an evening person, or maybe you can do this over your lunch break. There's several of the men in our church that have told me that during their lunch break, they go out to their car or their truck in the parking lot, and they sit there and have their devotions, and they pray. And I think that's marvelous. Whatever is your best time to be alone with God. 
We just finished studying the, first, the book of 1 Peter, and one of the most precious promises in that book is give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares for you. And that's in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Listen, something remarkable happens when you sit down and you relax in the presence of God. Now, the third thing that I want you to do, I want you to withdraw. I want you to get in His presence and wait and relax. And then I want you to watch. This is how you develop an ear for God. Open up your Bible. Take your Bible and open it up. And right now, I am going through the book of Acts as well as the book of Kings. And so, as you go through your Bible, you open it up and you just, you begin to read. Now, if you're brand new, you've never really started reading your Bible, then let me just recommend either start with the book of John, the Gospel of John, which so many people recommend that. As a new Christian, I can remember the first book I started reading. That was the book of Mark. Matter of fact, I read Mark, then I reread Mark, then I reread Mark, and then I reread Mark. It still is one of my favorite gospels because Mark is so full of action. The story and the action is nonstop. And so maybe start there or start with this Bible with some of these suggested reading tracks that I just shared with you here for just a few moments. There are some people that read and that read uh, the Psalms, they'll read five Psalms a day. There's 150 Psalms, and you can read five of them a day and go through it. Save Psalms 119 for the 31st day of the month. But uh, there are 31 Proverbs, and you can read a, pro book, a chapter of Proverbs every single day. And if you practice that as a habit, you'll learn how to worship, and you'll learn how to have just good common sense and wisdom. Trust me, if you will read Psalms and Proverbs, five chapters of Psalms, or maybe just, just read and a chapter from Proverbs, you're going to grow exponentially. Now, here's what I want to say, and this is the reason I kind of hesitated. Don't read for quantity. Read for quality. Read for depth. Read for understanding. As a matter of fact, I some, sometimes, sometimes when I'm talking to people who come to me and ask me about how to read their Bible, most Bibles, and like this one I have in my hands, most Bibles are broken up into, and if you can... I'm going to step up real close to the camera, so this may throw everybody for just a moment. But most Bibles are broken up with storylines, just like I'm showing you right here. There are storylines that fall along in the Bible, if you can see that. Well, what I do, when I, when, what I say to people is, if you're reading a story, read the story. Don't worry about the chapters and the verse, uh, and the verse numbers, but read the storyline. Follow along with the storyline and what you'll find yourself doing is you're growing by capturing the plot that's going on, the wisdom that's going on, why God left this for you. But if you break off in the middle of an important story because it ends in a chapter, it's like cutting off a movie right in the middle of the movie. You go, wait a minute, what's going on? You get the whole plot of the storyline when you do that. But read for depth, read for understanding. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, I pray, as a matter of fact, if you've got that up, or if, if you've got that in the, the, um, the app, read this with me. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Now listen, it's not how much you read, it's how much you retain. It's not how much you read, it's how much you retain. When I read that passage, one of the things that I do is I, every day I ask the Holy Spirit, would you just highlight, would you cause to stand out the verses in my life that I need to apply to my life today? For instance, yesterday morning, I am both digital and analog. I, I was just typing out verses in my, in my journal on my computer that the Holy Spirit just kind of highlighted for me. That's listening to God. Those verses stood out. I prayed over those verses. I pondered over those verses. During my day, I, I thought about those verses and applied them to my life. You see, the point I'm trying to make there is I have a brother-in-law that is just a fitness freak. I mean, I love him. Every We start off the New Year's together every year. We go to the gym together. He, Becky and I and he and his wife, we, we go to the gym together. And he's always reading on nutrition. He's always reading on health. And sometimes he'll go on these 1,000-calorie-a-day diets. 
And, but those 1,000 calories a day, they are so rich and they are so powerful that it gives him energy. And he's muscular and he's well-developed and he's athletic and he's very, very successful in what he does. And the reason he does that, he says, I get more energy out of that 1,000 calories. And he, he doesn't sustain that 1,000-calorie diet, but maybe for a week or two. He said, I get more energy out of that 1,000-calorie-a-day diet than I do when I'm eating 1,800 or 2,400 calories a day. You see, it's not a how much you consume. It's how much you retain. It's how much energy that you draw from it. So if you read, if you walk and say, I read 10 chapters today, and you don't retain it, what good has it done you? So the point I want to make here is, is watch carefully, look in the Bible, watch for what God wants to say to you. And I want to say something else. I love the spiritual gifts. I am thankful for all of the spiritual gifts. <clears throat> but Scripture always trumps spiritual gifts. Let me say that again. Scripture always trumps spiritual gifts. Because of my conviction and my passion that God speaks, and because of my conviction and my passion about healing and about the, the Word of God being made alive to us. There are sometimes people who come to me, and friends, they are just fruit loops. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but they'll come and say, God told them this, and it's either they've gotten their, their, their self-will, their flesh, as I talked about in the first part of this message, they've gotten it confused, or else the devil has really led them astray. If it goes outside the bounds of this Bible, I can tell you God has not spoken to you. And through the years, I have witnessed and seen people who have heard from God, and they've come and they've shared something with me. We've studied the Scriptures to see if those things were so, and we've seen great fruit from it. And then I've seen and experienced the tragedy of people, sometimes who've justified affairs, sometimes who've justified business decisions that they knew were not right. So I never hesitate, and there are people that worship at Woodland still with us, have come to me, and they've said, God told me this. And I said, well, let's look and see what the Bible says. And I never hesitate. If it's outside the bounds of Scripture, say, I do not believe God has told you that. Now, I don't dominate you. I'm not going to be a dictator in your life. God is not going to be a dictator in your life. God will lead you, and God will guide you. If you stubbornly persist to go this way, then you're on your own. And sometimes they've listened, and sometimes they've haven't. But you see, the key to all of this is we are taught in the book of Romans, in chapter 12, in the first two verses, that we are to mature, we are to grow, and we are to have our minds transformed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And as we mature in His Word, then the Bible says we're able to discern what is good, what is good means what is moral. What is good, that word means what is moral. What is acceptable, in other words, that, that, is, that is, is, is going to help us to prosper, that is going to help us to move ahead. And then what is pleasing, the Greek tense there means that that will fulfill and bring pleasure in every single way. I want to tell you, I find pleasure in doing the will of God. You will find pleasure doing in the will of God for now and for all eternity. You might find pleasure for sin in a season, but you will not find it for all eternity. And the pleasure you find in sin for a season will bring other people a boatload of heartache and a boatload of pain. Let me say it again. When I find what is good and acceptable and pleasing in God's sight, when I do that, then I experience good, other people experience good, but we experience it for eternity. But when you find pleasure in sin for a season, you might find pleasure in it, but other people are going to have a boatload of pain. They're going to have a boatload of regret, and sometimes they carry that regret all through their lifetimes, and only in heaven are they fully healed from that. And you, in the end, will find yourself hurting and saying, oh, why did I do that? I found pleasure in it for a while, but now it's bought such heartache and it's bought such loss. Please hear the words of this preacher this morning. If you will listen to God, it will lead you to life. It will lead you to liberty. It will lead you to freedom. It will lead you to joy. It will lead you to prosperity. It will lead you to health. It will lead you to an overcoming life. It will lead you to victory. But if you listen to the flesh or your self-will or you listen to the devil, 
it will lead you into captivity, addiction, and bondage like you've never dreamed besides the hurt and the pain that you bring upon others. So it's important that we learn to withdraw. Don't be afraid of solitude. We learn to wait. We learn to watch. But we also, we learn to weed. We learn to weed. You see, Jesus often compares a listening heart to a garden. As a matter of fact, he said about people's hearts using this whole uh, metaphor of a garden, he said that some hearts are hard and rocky, some hearts are full of weeds, and then some hearts, they have good soil in there. In there. So one person has a hard heart, and they never hear the word of the Lord. They never hear God speaking, and they're the ones that mock and say, oh, I've never heard God. If God's talking, let him talk to me. You know, you're not going to get anywhere by trying to challenge God like that. You're not going to get anywhere with a heart of unbelief. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And then some people, the word of God falls in their hearts, and then they never weed the garden of their heart because weeds begin to grow up and begin to choke it out. I want to make a little prediction right now, okay? Just a little fun prediction. There are a lot of people planting gardens right now. There are a lot of people planting flower beds, and it's so much fun to put the seed into the ground and watch it come up. But you know who the successful gardeners are? They're the people that have prepared the soil. And they're the people that keep the garden weeded. And trust me, it is no fun weeding a garden. It is no fun pulling up the weeds, pulling up the crabgrass, bending over to get all that done. But God says if we don't do that, then it will choke our hearts and you won't receive the word of the Lord. But if we weed our hearts, if we keep the garden of our heart weeded out, then that good soil, the word of God will grow and prosper in our lives. Listen to what the Bible says. If I had not confessed the sin of my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. You see, weeding, it's keeping my heart pure. And Jesus said, now listen, isn't this good? Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Come on, victory. Think about that. You see, confessing my sins is one of the best things I can do. Oh, sometimes I hate to have to come back and confess this sin over and say, Lord, I am coming back to you one more time. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. You know, sometimes, to be honest, I, I make, oh, Lord, but it was their fault. If they hadn't have done this, if they hadn't have said that, then I would have, no, 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 no. Don't start blaming and don't start the butt game. Instead, just go before the Lord and say, Father, I'm sorry. You said I should be patient. You said I should be kind. You said I should be loving. You said I should be generous. You said, you said I should pay attention. I didn't. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And you know what? It is God's joy and it's God's delight to wipe you clean of your sin. And what you're doing is you're weeding your heart and your sins, listen, your sin then doesn't keep you from seeing God doesn't keep you from hearing God. But if we walk around with unconfessed sin in our hearts, the Lord will not listen. So when I find a sin that somehow or another creeps into my life and maybe it becomes a regular pattern, I just simply go back to my Bible and I say, what promise from God can I claim that's mine about being patient, about being kind, about being loving, about being self-controlled? And then I write down in my journal, I just simply write down, how am I going to celebrate when I get victory in this area of my life? How am I going to celebrate? And I may say to my wife, I may say to my children, I may say to friends and prayer partners of mine, I say, let me know as you see me growing in this area of my life. And then I'm going to celebrate. I may buy a new book. I may go out and, and, and take my wife to dinner. I may do something. But you just you want to have something to celebrate. Because that's all a part of maturing. When the seed is sown in good soil, you're going to grow. When the Word of God falls upon good heart soil, you're going to hear from God. Trust me. Listen, please trust me on this. When the Word of God falls upon good soil, 
you're going to hear from God. And you'll go during the day, you'll have these impressions, you'll have these nudges, and you'll know what the Word of God says about it, and you will be confident in acting on that. Now, let's get to the journal part. Number five, write. Number five is write. So what I do is I write down one or two verses a day, generally from my Scripture reading. And when I write down those one or two verses, and to do this, um, most of the time I type those in. I have a digital journal and I have a paper journal that I write in. And in my digital journal, I'll type out the verses. But when it comes time to pray, then I take my paper journal, and here's where I've just started with this one, and I just take my paper journal, and I will start writing down, and I don't know if I'm going to step up to the camera close again, and I just lost something there. But I'll step up and I'll start writing in my paper journal. And I have my own kind of shorthand that uh, I have explained to my family so they can, they can interpret it after I go to heaven because there's a lot of things in here that I want to affirm them with and I want to reassure them with and after I've already gone to heaven. But right now, this is from uh, just a few days ago. The presence of God is sustaining me. This is right in the middle of the COVID crisis. The Bi- and, you know, I just turned to this. I didn't plan this at all. But the Bible is my food. And worship is when I drink from the wells of salvation. And, you know, I just, I don't write a lot. I just write down a few lines or a few sentences. Uh, you know, right here, I, my wife is my loving delight. And then I say some other things that aren't any of your business here about her that are, wow, that was pretty poetic that day. So I'm turning red, so I'm going to put that to the side. But what I do is I don't try to write a lot. I'll just write one or two words or whatever's on my heart and mind that I believe that God is speaking to me. Y'all pray for me because I'm going to hear about this when I get home. But it's why God said to Jeremiah, look at this verse with me, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 2. Write down for the record everything I have said to you, Jeremiah. Write down for the record everything I have said to you. So, why don't you do this? When you journal, what did you learn about God? What did you learn about Jesus? What did you learn about the Holy Spirit? Was there encouragement that you found from reading your Bible? Was there a promise that you could claim while reading your Bible? Was there a warning that you found while you were reading your Bible? Was there a principle to build your life upon? The book of Proverbs is full of those. Was there a a command that you need to obey? Was there a sin that you need to avoid? Is there something that God invites you into? There have been times where God has invited me into some deeper steps of faith while I've been reading. Remember when I talked about the storyline a while ago? Maybe I've been reading about David. Maybe I've been reading about uh, Nehemiah. And I, and I think about their story. And I can tell you two times, once in my life where I was reading something that David said, and I just felt the Holy Spirit invite me into a deeper walk of faith. And I came into the sanctuary and I knelt down and I said, Lord, I'm not even sure I understand this. I know this is what your word says and I don't know how to apply it. But as I learned to apply it, friends, I grew exponentially and I think the people that I'm responsible for grew. Another time reading the book of Nehemiah, I grew as a leader because I felt God inviting me into a deeper level of leadership. Let me just tell you what. Uh, I read from a book years and years ago that Gordon MacDonald wrote called Ordering Your Private World. You can still get it on Amazon. It's a great book. I read it back in the 80s when I was in my 20s. But listen to what he said. Writing is sifting out the most important issues. Writing is a boost to meditation and prayer. Let me read that again. And I'll read it a little slower if you want to kind of write it down. Writing is sifting out the most important issues. Writing is a boost to meditation and prayer. And that's by Gordon MacDonald. And then finally this morning, the sixth word is worship. Is worship. When I'm done and I've prayed and I've listened to the Lord and I pray while I read my Bible, I just drop to my knees and I lift my hands. If you go to Woodland, you know I've I've shared this with you. You know, I go to my knees because it reminds me of who God is and who I am. It reminds me that my Father is the great I am, that He is the Almighty God. There is nothing too big for Him. There's nothing too great for Him. As a matter of fact, 
I think it honors God when I ask him big, bold prayer requests. I think it honors God when we express our faith. I worship him for who he is, not for what he's done so much, but I worship him for who he is. He's kind, he's loving, he's patient, he's just, he's faithful, he's true. I worship him because I know that one day all of this world is going to make sense. All evil is going to be punished and done away with forever. And there in heaven, he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more hurting. Now can you understand why I, <coughs> pardon me, why I lift up my hands so often and sing, shut in with God in a secret place, there in his presence, beholding his face, gaining new power to run in the race. Oh, how I love to be shut in with God. Friends, I'm telling you, when I rise up from this time, just practicing these words that I have said, read to you here this morning, I rise up with energy, I rise up with strength, even when I have been in the hospitals, even when I have had surgeries, even when I've experienced loss, and I've kept this discipline of just going before the Lord, God gives power and God gives strength. Listen to Psalms 95 and verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people He watches over, the flock under His care. If only you would listen to His voice today. Now, please don't log off. I know that you know that I'm fixing to close. I've reached the end of the outline. And the staff tells me every week when I get to the last point, people start logging off because you think you've got it all. Friends, I'm landing this plane right now. And when you're landing the plane, you want to land safely. And if you log off, you haven't landed and gotten to the terminal to your destination yet. As a matter of fact, if the plane doesn't land, you crash and you could die. <coughs> and I believe that God is speaking to some of you right now. Don't waste this time in this coronavirus crisis. I don't care if you've got problems or pain. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got pain. Whatever you're going through, you may be tempted to stop getting alone with God, but you can hear God. God will speak to you. God will lead you. God will guide you if you will just simply take time to be alone with Him. God has always been faithful to do what He said He would do. And God will give you the direction. He will give you the guidance. He will dominate you. He will lead you. God doesn't want a robot that is programmed God wants a man or a woman who has their heart set upon pleasing God. And so I'm going to ask you right now, right there with your children, would you just close your eyes and would you lift your hands to him? And maybe you would just want to slip off your sofa and you want to kneel by your coffee table or by the sofa or chair and lead your family right now just by lifting up your hands and let's adore him. We sing at Christmas, oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Father, we lift our hands, and we adore you this morning, and we thank you for the great love that you have sent us. And we thank you that we can trust your word. And when we wait upon you, when we withdraw, Lord, and get along with you, when we watch carefully what the word of God says, when we keep our hearts weeded, Lord, and as we write down the impressions or the scriptures that God gives to us, Lord, we can trust we will hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk you there in it. And I thank you that those impressions that you give us, they're pure, they're peaceable, they're pleasing unto you, they will prosper us, <laughs> Lord, they will make us productive or fruitful. I thank you, Lord, that we know how to judge those impressions as whether they're from God or whether they're from the pizza we ate last night. Lord, I just lift my hands in worship that the God that I cannot see has given me his word that I can read and your Holy Spirit that lives in me and communicates with me. And even now, Although I know everyone's listening in, I'm having a conversation with you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And you know, 
I don't think I've ever done that just like that on the live stream. But I really believe that this is a time, if you've listened and you're not a Christian, this is a time for you to trust God. If there's something in you, you're wanting to give your heart to Jesus Christ, you're wanting to serve God, my beloved friend, hear me. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you. No man comes to God unless the Spirit of the Lord draws them. And the very fact that you want to do that, even though you don't understand it all yet, and maybe this is your first exposure to the gospel, but right now is the time. God has a wonderful, wonderful plan for your life. God wants to bless you. God wants to save you. God wants to give you a fresh start in life. And God wants you to know you can hear Him. So why don't you just ask Him right now. Maybe pray just like this, and you just say it sincerely before the Lord, and He'll hear you. Say, Heavenly Father, thank You for loving me so much that You sent Your Son, Jesus, to die for my sins. I am so grateful to know there is a way that I can be saved. There is a way that I can become a new man or a new woman, that I can have a fresh start in life and have all of my sins as my moral failures forgiven. I don't understand it all, but I accept your gift of free and eternal life in Christ Jesus today. And as much as I know how, I commit my life to you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. And say this, amen, amen. Amen means let it be, so be it, Lord. Well, I love you so much. I am so thankful I've had this chance to come into your home or wherever you're listening to and to worship with you. And if you committed your life to Christ, I've kept holding this Bible up for a reason. I want you to know you can have it. It won't cost you anything. All you need to do is just <clears throat> send us an email at office at woodland.church. That's all you need, office at woodland.church. And in the subject line, you put Bible. And if you would, just send me a short email. Tell me you gave your heart to Christ. Let me help you get started in your life with Jesus. I'd love to send you some digital gifts that will help you and just you start your life. I've been creating some digital gifts that I can send you. Uh, they're PDF files. You can download them on your phone or you can download them on your iPad or whatever device you use to get started in your new life with Christ. But I'd love to help you get started with that. Secondly, if you're a part of this church family or if you would like to help us here, please be sure to tithe and to bring your offerings. Tomorrow I'll be sending out our, our missions check tomorrow to support our missionaries around the world. And we have fallen off some, as you can imagine, on our giving. Many people have been faithful. Many people have been tithing. And I know that some people may not have jobs right now, and I don't want to put any pressure on you. I'm not asking you to do that. But if you have means by which you can give, please tithe tomorrow or today. You can go online and do that right now. I loved the story that Pastor Corey shared that I shared in the prayer meeting in our prayer service last night that when he was 19 years old and his college tuition bill came due and he couldn't pay it, college here in Michigan, <clears throat> that um, when he couldn't pay it, they sent him a 30-day collection notice. And he said, Pastor, I kept tithing, and I was able within the next two weeks, if I remember correctly, to completely pay off my bill. Friends, God will rebuke the devourer. God will cause the, the, the boundary lines to fall for you in pleasant places. I believe that God will open new jobs and better jobs for you. God will cause your, your baskets, your accounts, God will cause them to overflow as you put Him first with your tithe. That's not me saying that. That's what God says in Malachi chapter 3. Read it for yourself, that God will prosper you and He will bless you. So I, I'm not trying to do a hard sell here, but what I am trying to do is say to you, because I love you, I want you taken care of, and the best money management principle I know is to put God first with your tithe. I love you so much. I hope that you will remember the bags by the bumper and join us as we reach out to continue to bless our community. Uh, by the way, Convoy of Hope is going to be blessing us with over 100 cases of food that we're going to be able to help the hungry with here in our community as well. See, God is going to provide. That I'm confident of. I love you. God bless you. Be sure and join me Wednesday night or join Pastor Rick Wednesday night. He's going to be preaching the word.